And our program tonight is titled The Kansas River and Eudora. And uh, the Kansas River has, of course, long dominated the landscape, the culture, and the history of Eudora. Today, a group called Friends of the Caw is responsible for preserving and maintaining the large river. Dawn Bueller is the leader of the Friends of the Caw, and she is known as the Kansas River Keeper. And Dawn is our presenter for tonight. I've gotten to know Dawn a bit in the past few months, and I have to say that I'm very impressed with her passion and her knowledge on the river, the history of it, and of Eudora. And I think we're very fortunate to have someone like her with her passion and vision right here in Eudora. And I couldn't be happier that she was kind enough to join us here for our program tonight. And I want you to please welcome Dawn Bueller. Don Bueller. I'm actually from DeSoto, moved to Eudora in 2000, so I moved a whole seven miles down the road. Um, born and raised in DeSoto on a farm. We had about a 2,000 acre crop farm in the, in the valley there in the farmland along the river. So my family grew vegetables. We had potatoes and corn and uh, watermelon. We had a little market. Um, in DeSoto called Riverview Farms Market. That was my family. And we all worked the fields all summer. So I grew up on the river, um, right at DeSoto where our land was. I um, would get in and out of the river there in our John boat with my dad to go catfishing. And we canoed the river when I was young. Um, there was only one boat ramp back then and it was here in Eudora on the Wakarusa. So we would rent canoes and come up here to Eudora, put them in, paddle all the way down to DeSoto where our land was, which is just before the present day boat ramp in DeSoto, and we would get off the river there. So we also camped on the river. Um, so I have a great history with it. People ask me what my favorite section of the river is, and I always say, well, my favorite is between DeSoto and Eudora, because I know it well. I know where the holes are to go fishing, that section of the river hasn't changed much. Um, a lot of it's due to really good land practices. The riparian zone, which is that area between the river and the uplands, it's been pretty consistently protected with trees that hold the soil in place so that the river doesn't do a lot of cuts and take the, take the bank. So when my sister and I paddled that section here recently, and we both said, you know, I just don't think much has changed through here it still looks a lot the same. Whereas you'll see other parts of the river where, um, frankly, um, land use has, has happened all the way up to the edge that when we've had the really, really high floods, it'll just rip a whole entire bank out. So um, anyway, that's my background. I live south of Eudora, about seven miles. My son is a Eudora High School graduate. He graduated from Eudora High School in 2012, and he just graduated from K-State. So we're really happy about that. <laughs> so we're going to get started. I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about what I know of the history of the Kansas River. And you'll learn much more about the local history when the waterways exhibit goes in as well. But I'm also going to tell, talk to you about what we do about watershed, about the watershed and some of the work that we're doing to protect water quality. There's a lot going on right now in the Kansas River. So this is just real quick about Friends of the Caw. This is our mission. So we protect and preserve the Kansas River for present and future generations. We promote recre recreational access. We um, advocate for the rehabilitation of the river, including its water quality and its wildlife habitat. And we also work with other agencies to do that in the state. So Friends of the Caw supports what's called the Kansas River Keeper. That's my job, the River Keeper. So I hold the community accountable for the health of the river. So what that means is that when we're sitting in meetings, and this happens a lot, and people are talking about something that's going to happen to the river, my job is to raise my hand and say, wait, 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 what about the river? What about how it's going to impact the river? How is, it going to, how is what we're going to do going to impact it? Is it going to impact it in a positive way or in a negative way? 
So I'm, my job is to be the ears, eyes, voice of the Kansas River, and advocates in the role of a leader. So this is kind of my, in a nutshell, job, and it's a really, really great job. Monitor, respond, and mediate suspected pollution. So if there's pollution on the river, we have a hotline that people can call, and we'll help them work through the channels. Either we'll report it, or they can report it, but we'll make sure that it gets cleaned up. Uh, I manage our advocacy efforts. I do spend a lot of time in January and February and March at the Capitol. Uh, doing a lot of education to legislators about the river, um, trying to help them understand what all the issues are. We schedule and facilitate our educational paddle trips. That's probably what we're most famous for. Everyone says, oh, you have this great job. You paddle on the river every day. I'm like, yeah, I do paddle on the river a lot because I have to monitor it for pollution. But the paddle trips really is only about 20% of what I do because we do so much more education and advocacy as well. But we do a lot of paddle trips. We do them every weekend. We're out on the river with groups teaching them about the river. And we promote recreation. So we're a member of Waterkeeper Alliance. There's over 300 now, and I need to update this number. There's over 300 waterkeepers worldwide. They're called river keepers, water keepers, coastal keepers, bay keepers, just a keeper of a waterway. And so um, our organization is headed by Bobby Kennedy Jr. Um, he's an environmental attorney, and uh, he started out with Waterkeeper Alliance. Do you remember back in the 60s and 70s, the Hudson River used to catch on fire? It was from pollution. And so um, the commercial fishery there, the commercial fishermen were losing their livelihood, and so they got really upset about it, and they finally said, you know, we need to go after those polluters. And they teamed up with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and they went after him because he had just gotten out of law school. He was an environmental attorney and they won. And that was the very first river keeper and it was on the Hudson River. And so um, it's been growing ever since. Kansas, we got our river keeper about 10, 12 years ago. So. so this is a little history. How many of you are native Kansans? Do you guys know what the call means? So when I was a kid, my dad, you know, we grew up on the river, and he would just call the river the Caw. He never called it the Kansas River. So I didn't know it as anything else, and it wasn't until I was much older that I figured out that it was the same, the Kansas River and the Caw River. So the Kansas Indians, for whom the state of Kansas is named, lived along the Missouri River at least as far back as the 1730s that we know of. In the winter, they lived in those large grass or brush lodges and villages along the stream. And during the summer, the people left the village to hunt buffalo on the plains. But by 1800, they had started to migrate west, and they settled along the Kansas River as far as Fort Riley. The river was used for trading and travel as far back as the 1700s. And it was one of the first dangers that travelers faced on the Oregon Trail. So most crossed in the spring when the call was full. And so they crossed at Poppins Ferry. Do you all know where Poppins Ferry is in downtown Topeka? You probably do if you're history buffs. So um, the city of Topeka is working on a new exhibit or a new um, historical point at Poppins Ferry. And it's going to be right down there by the Great Overland Station. We're really excited about that. We've been working with, the, um, with them on that and, and being a partner in it. We're really excited that they're going to be able to bring that piece of history to Topeka. And then the call ran high in spring, but it's shallow and braided with sandbars most of the year. And so most of you that, that live here know that she'll get really high in the spring, and then come summer, you can see the channel meander its way down the river. And so people will say, well, isn't that thing dangerous? Well, it is when the water's high, but so is every other river when the water's high. You have to go on it at the right time. So in the spring, when the water was high, there were 34 steamboats. I thought this was cool. 34 steamboats that are known to apply the Kansas from 1854 to 1866 with cargoes of freight and passengers. I find that hard to believe because it's so shallow and so braided. I'm just surprised they didn't get stuck. 
Um, the Lightfoot of Quindaro was said to be the first boat built in Kansas Territory, and it was specifically built for the call. I was like, they must have had a lot of rain during this time period. But it spent more than a month in 1857 making the round trip from Kansas City to Lawrence, most of the time stuck on sandbars. So we're guessing rainfall must have stopped. So they shifted that to operating on the Missouri River, which the Missouri is much bigger, much faster. To give you an idea, the Kansas River flows most of the time at a rate of about three or 4,000 cubic feet per second. Now, right now it's higher because we've had a lot of rain. It's, it's running around 11,000 cubic feet per second and all the reservoirs are releasing into the river. But the Missouri River will run at 30 or 40,000 cubic feet per second. So it's a much bigger river than the Kansas River. So navigation was doomed by an act of the Kansas legislature in 1864 that declared the call non-navigable. But then a it was a political move that was designed to help the railroads build bridges and dams. But the law was repealed in 1913 and the call was again declared navigable, but by then there was little demand for river travel. And frankly, I'm sure there was some hesitation because they were going to be stuck all the time. <laughs> most of the year anyway. So this is a little bit of information about the river. It's the longest prairie-based river in the world. In the world, we have that designation. It's home to a wide variety of plants and animals. Um, we see a lot of turtles and um, lots of birds, lots of shorebirds. Um, it depends on what time of the year you're on the river as to what you'll see. Its banks are homes to 60% of the population in Kansas. It's a very diverse species of a fish community, which most people just think, oh, there's only catfish in there. But that's not really true. It has a very diverse fish community. There were originally 48 mussel species in Kansas, and of those, six are extirpated, and one is almost, and 39 have suffered range reductions or widespread thinning. A lot of this with the mussel species has to do with the fact that we raise the level and drop it, raise it and drop it, and you leave those mussels stranded. They'll get stranded on the sandbars, um, and then also pollution. They're very susceptible to pollution. A record 25 nesting pair of bald eagles are on the Kansas River. That's a record. And I will tell you a little tidbit. Um, yesterday, or day before Sunday, it was Sunday, Mother's Day, I live just south of door, about seven miles on 2100 Road, and a bald eagle flew past my house and sat in the tree above my pond. I have never seen a bald eagle on my property before. I hope he comes back. This is the Kansas River watershed, and this is pretty cool. So the Kansas River watershed is 53,000 square miles. It's about the size of Ohio, predominant land use is agriculture. So I want to show you here so you can see. This is Kansas. Here's the white line. This is Nebraska, Colorado. So almost the entire upper half of Kansas is in the Kansas River watershed. This little piece right here is not because it actually flows to the Missouri River. But watersheds are like the little cups that kids play with where they're one inside of the other and they try and stack them. Watersheds are within watersheds are within watersheds. And so the Kansas River watershed, which is, this is it right here, it sits within the Missouri River watershed. The Missouri River watershed is 550,000 square miles. Then the Missouri watershed sits within the Mississippi. Yeah, which goes to the Gulf of Mexico. So this was a pretty cool number here. 34,000 square miles is in Kansas. And Nebraska, south of the Platte River, is 16,000 square miles, almost 17,000. And there's eight, almost 9,000 square miles in northeast Colorado. So it goes all the way up to Lyman. So if we think about this for a second, imagine that if it rains out in Lyman, Colorado, we don't use it or divert it, it'll make its way to the Kansas River. The Kansas River starts here. It's all the way down here. So this whole entire landscape, so when we talk to for, um, lots of kids and high schoolers. Um, this is what we talk about because this is where the impact to the water quality is. People say, well, why is the Kansas River so 
dirtier? Why does it have pollution problems? Well, because it's got 53,000 square miles that drain to it. And we don't have any control over Nebraska or Colorado and what they do on their landscape. We do have control over what we do on our landscape. And so we try and educate people about how we can do better land use practices or ways that we can reduce pollution, even with construction sites or you know, non-point source pollution. The stuff that runs off the landscape is the biggest uh, thing that travels and takes pollution to the river. Right, so a watershed is, is an area where everything drains to a single point. And so we've often said in the water world that we should not have political boundaries. Political boundaries should be based on watersheds because all the decisions are made within that watershed boundary about water use, about where water flows, water rights, everything that has to do with water happens within the watershed. So down here below is the Arkansas watershed, which it doesn't even belong as part of the Missouri. It's in a whole nother watershed. So this is the Kansas River Valley. This is pretty cool information. So it's 138 miles long, but the Kansas River is 173 miles long. So we're talking the River Valley. If you just took a straight arrow and threw it from uh, Junction City all the way to Kansas City, Kansas, where the Kansas River meets the Missouri River. That whole entire distance is 138 miles long. But the Kansas River meanders, right? And so it's 173. So in the 148 mile stretch between the, the gauging stations or the gauges they have on the river that can give us information about the, the river and the water quality, from Fort Riley to Bottom Springs, the river drops 294 feet. You don't think about that, that it's dropping in elevation. It gives us an average gradient over this distance of almost exactly two feet per mile. Everyone thinks this Kansas is completely flat. There's even a drop in the river. So the valley is the widest between Wamego and Rossville. It's about four miles wide. So in this river valley, this is where we have all of this um, discussion about the use of sand. Because sand is, is highly sought after from the Kansas River. And we'll talk about dredging here in a second. But in many places, like from Eudora, from the source to Eudora, it's up to three miles wide. But below Eudora, the valley narrows to less than one and a half miles. So right through here, we've got a pretty wide river valley. So this is why what we do is so important. 800,000 people get their drinking water from the Kansas River. 800,000 people, that's a lot of people that are relying on the river for their drinking water. Now, communities like um, Lawrence, they get their river from the surface water of the, or their water, their river, their water from the surface water of the Kansas River, and they also get it from uh, the Clinton Lake. That's where they pull their water from. But the city of Topeka, their only source of drinking water is the Kansas River, the surface water. And so we often talk about that. They don't have a backup plan. So right now, you know, they don't really have any communities or industry that are upstream that we would be concerned about. But, you know, as, as communities develop and things develop, that's something we need to watch for, um, is what is happening upstream of these communities especially the ones that are pulling in drinking water from the surface water. Now, the city of Eudora has um, alluvial aquifers. They're wells where the river water actually comes down through the sand and it's pumped back out. That's still river water, but it's cleansed as it makes its way through the sand um, into the well. Um, it's not exactly pulled off the surface water of the Kansas River. So every, every community is different. I live south of Eudora. I have Douglas County Rural Water Number Four, and they actually get a lot of their water from Clinton Lake. So my water comes around down 458, probably. <laughs> so it's a little bit about watershed management. We were talking about the watershed. So see how everything drains to a single point. 
So Kansas has 30,278 30, classified stream miles, and the Kansas River is 173 miles long. So that's a lot of stream miles that we have to work on protecting. Now, my job is only to worry about the Kansas River, but as a state as a whole, we have a lot of stream miles. So we say this often, what happens on the plains impacts the Kansas River, because what happens within our watershed is going to impact that water supply. So we have lots of conservation measures that we've put in place as a state um, to try and reduce uh, the erosion, um, reduce the soil. Soil carries nutrients into the water. So that's how we get high levels of phosphorus and high levels of nitrates in the, in the river, in the water. And so the state has one program called the RAPS program, Watershed Restoration and Protection Strategy, and that is where they give cost share dollars to landowners to install conservation practices to improve their water quality. That's just one way. When I was a kid, I would put my hand below the surface of the Kansas River, and, and you couldn't see it, first of all. And if you picked your hand up, it just kind of dripped in mud. Now, it still gets like that when we've had a really hard rain, like a five-inch rain, and it's just rained and rained and rained, and the river will get that muddiness to it. But once it clears off and clears up, when I'm out in my kayak, I can see down to the sandbar. It's totally different. And a lot of that has to do with these conservation practices that have, that have been put into place, but it also has to do with farmers practicing no-till and cover crops, lots of practices that keep that soil on the land so that they can use it and keep it healthy and keep it from washing down into the waterway. So we have 10 counties that are directly on the Kansas River. Now many, many more counties use the river, but there's 10 that are on it. We have hydropower generated at Bowersock. You guys know about that in Lawrence. So we have hydropower generated there. The river generates electricity. It gives us water to drink. And this is a picture here at Bowersock. And it provides recreation. So these are some of our challenges. So I wanted to show you this. This is just some, uh, this is sometimes naturally occurring after a rain. This is a clear day on a sandbar. This is actually right at DeSoto. Um, I was out there one day. This is a tire dump that we cleaned up. So we clean the Kansas River, we do cleanups. We have a lot of volunteers that are really fabulous and help us do that. But at this spot here, this was between Eudora and DeSoto in the Weaver Bottoms. And the landowner gave us permission to come in and clean this up. I think he had bought the property and it was already this way. Um, we cleaned up over 500 tires off the river. 500 tires. So we, when we do these cleanups, we do them with West Star Energy's green team because they have boom trucks. They'll bring in their boom trucks and they'll help us lift all of these off the shoreline. And also they have really, really great volunteers. Their full-time employees will volunteer to be on this green team to help do these environmental projects. So we also did this year um, up in Lawrence, the old bridge. You guys know that, you know, you probably know this, but, you know, they used to just drop bridges, drop them right into the river. And so we have many places, like in Topeka, well, in Topeka, the railroad bridge dropped because of the 51 flood, but it's still there, along with some locomo locomotives. We don't really know what all's down there. Um, but in Lawrence, they felled the old bridge to put in the new one. And there was all this metal that would constantly stick up out of the sandbar. So last November, we went with West Star Energy Screen Team down on that sandbar with saws and I don't know what all equipment they had. It was amazing. Cut all that metal out and hauled it off in canoes and john boats to the shoreline. And some of it was recycled and some of it was used for art. We had an, a sculptor that wanted some of it from KU. So they came and took some of it. So we do this every year. We do lots and lots of these cleanups. So this year, we're, we just want a grant. We're gonna paddle the entire 173 miles over the summer and we're going to inventory all the cleanup sites 
Last time we did that was in 2008, so we've got to update it. Like, for example, I find that this is just, I'm like, how does this stuff get there? But down in Manhattan, there's an area called the Battery Bar. That's what we call it, the Battery Bar. It's a, it's a sandbar that has old batteries on it. And I'm like, how did those batteries get there? Just wonder what the story is. Um, I always wonder what the story is behind things. But So we're going to put that on our list along with many others. So we'll be doing that this year. These are some of the challenges we face. So point source and non-point source pollution. Point source is where it comes out of a pipe. They have to have a permit for that. Non-point is everything that runs off the landscape. So if your car leaks oil, it washes right into the river. If you pour something on the ground, it washes into the river. So it's everything that comes across the landscape. Land use changes impact the river. Let's say that somebody here went down and decided to, you know, change, take out a whole thing of trees along the Wakarusa. That would, that would change the direction that that river flows. It would totally change it. Um, population increases and demands on water. So on the Wakarusa, we know that it meets the Kansas River right here at Eudora, right? It runs 80, like 80 miles um, all the way across. It starts actually in Wabunsee County, um, barely into the, across the Wabunsee County line and comes across and is dammed at Clinton Lake and then makes its way to Eudora. So this little tidbit on the Wakarusa, but, uh, and dredging for sand, that's also something that's bad for the river. Now, it's not bad for economy and for construction and for roads, and we recognize that. So these are the dredge operations. Do you guys know that there used to be one right out here in Eudora? So it's changed the landscape of the river. Um, do you guys know where uh, Mud Creek is that comes in? So right out there um, is where the dredge was. It was an in-river dredge. They moved it out and put it into a pit mine in the Weaver Bottoms area. You guys probably see the trucks all the time when you go the back way to Lawrence. Um, we actually, we promote moving those into the pit mines and getting them out of the river because we're interested in preserving the river channel. But um, that particular uh, dredge site, the river was, um, it was going on a, let's say a straight path, and that dredge hole went in, and then it cut all the way around by Mud Creek, and it left an island there, and when it did that, it cut off Mud Creek completely from the Kansas River. So right now, there's a trickle about this wide of where Mud Creek comes into the Kansas River. So now when the river's high, it's more connected, but the city of Lawrence recently closed that boat ramp because of that. There was, there was no way that that um, Mud Creek was going to have any water flow in it, except when it was at flood level. So this is what we call it, polluted and poetic. Um, it depends on your opinion or of what you think is good or bad for the river. It usually depends on your stake in the river, whether or not you think that dredging is good or bad. We're, we advocate that uh, we know that sand is important to our local economy. We know that sand is needed for roads and for concrete. Um, we just want to see it moved into the pit lines. So this is just to give you an idea of what the dredging is. It's removing the bottom substrate from the channel, and it's primarily used for construction materials. Now, this has been going on as far back as the 1900s. So this has been going on in Kansas for a very long time. But we do have sections of the river where we can prove that it has altered the course of the river. It has changed the way that, it, that it's moved or flowed. And one of the things that, that I've always thought is, you know, I no longer own land along the Kansas River. But if I did, and there was a dredge site there, I wouldn't be very happy because it's eventually going to take part of your land. It's going to take it one way or the other. Because what happens is, is when you dig a big hole in the middle of the river, the river has to fill it, right? I mean, you can't just leave a hole and expect that it won't fill it. So the river works to fill that hole back up. Well, if you've got a 70-foot hole, that's a lot of sand. Well, where do you think it's going to come from? It's going to come from your bank. The river's going to pull it from those banks. So you're going to see trees collapse, and that's what we saw at Mud Creek. 
trees collapsing into the river, loss of that wildlife habitat, loss of fisheries habitat. Um, and then we did notice, we paddled that section here recently, and we noticed that the Asian carp were much more active right at that dredge site. And we've not, we've not done any studies yet, but we're wondering whether there's any uh, connection there. This is just a picture of a collapsed bank, just to give you an idea. This was 2008 to 2011. That's erosion that happened where there was a dredge site. So that's what I meant when I said, you know, taking someone's land, the river would take it. So I'm going to skip right past this. We were listed as one of America's most endangered rivers um, in 2012. And they continue to put us on the edge of the list. Um, every year we're one of them that they consider as one of America's most endangered rivers. And they, and they uh, designate that because of the dredging on the river. And these are some sandbars that are collapsing out on the river, just to give you an idea of what they look like. And this is what we call riprap. It's concrete that's put back on the bank after the dredge site moves out. So, so I want to tell you about some future things that are happening, because these are really cool. I want to make sure I'm still good on time. So have any of you heard of the governor's future for, or vision for the future of water supply in Kansas? Has anybody heard about that a little bit? So they created this water vision and so and created regional advisory committees. And the purpose is to look at that entire watershed we were talking about and figure out how to do things that will help the river. And so I sit on that uh, committee um, for the Kansas Basin. So that's this area right here. This is the Kansas Basin. So it includes Eudora. And so we're making decisions right now that impact this part of the watershed. And one of the biggest things that we're dealing with is the sedimentation of the reservoirs, which we know is important to our drinking water supply. And the other thing is Milford Lake. Did any of you go to Milford? Milford? Nobody goes to Milford? Oh my gosh, it's so pretty. And it's such a great wiper fish lake to go fishing. But uh, Milford Lake is has a lot of blue-green algae in it. And a lot of that is caused from a lot of nutrients coming into it. So those are some of the things that we're working on. I just wanted you to know that we are working on some things at the state level to try and help the Kansas River. So this is one thing that if you take anything home today, I do want you to take this home because this just happened. So the Kansas River was accepted into the Sustainable Rivers Program. Now this is a really big deal because We've been working with the Corps of Engineers for a long time on different things on the Kansas River, and now there's a program that they have where they're in partnership with the Nature Conservancy. So um, the Healthy Streams Manager at the Nature Conservancy, she and I went to the Corps in January, and we said, would you consider putting the Kansas River into this Sustainable Rivers Program? And we were shocked that they said yes. And we were really excited. So they had to make an application. Well, you can apply every year. So we didn't expect that the river would get accepted that first year. And it did. We got notified, um, it was about the 1st of March, that the Kansas River had been accepted into the program. So what this means is that we are now going to work in partnership with the Corps of Engineers to try and get more ecological flows on the Kansas River. So that means more flows for wildlife, more flows for the mussels, more flows for the fish, more flows for bank stabilization. So what they'll do is they'll go, we'll go up and down the river and figure out who all the users are. And there's a lot, it's a working river. Everybody that is a water intake, everybody that generates electricity, um, the city of Every city that uses it in some way, even for wastewater, you know, when they put their water back out, we will inventory all of this. And then what the Corps will do is they'll try and figure out if they can tweak their dam operations. So those flows. So one of my pet peeves is the Wakarusa River in Eudora because it's channelized, um, the banks are collapsing. The tree roots are hanging from it, and it's from that high water, and then you drop it. 
high water and you drop it. And that's what, you know, they're, they're managing for flood control. So they're doing what they're authorized to do by Congress. I mean, they're doing what they're supposed to do. But what happens is, is that we have all these other impacts that it makes. So we're hoping that through this program that we can get some of those things fixed to where they don't quite drop it as fast or they don't quite raise it as quickly or maybe they can spread it out over a longer period of time. And maybe we can factor in when those mussels are at a critical time on the river and not leave them stranded without water and without a way to get back where they need to go. So this is a really, really, really cool program. We are thrilled. It'll probably take five to 10 years for us to get through this process. But this is our, um, well, we've been celebrating, let's just say that. We're really excited. So these are some other points along the river. This is the wastewater discharge at Lawrence, and this is just an example of one of those pipes sticking out. You'll see those all up and down the river where they have a permit to discharge. And they treat that. I mean, they don't just dump everything back in. They're required to treat it. But like this is the Lawrence um, Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's right down the side of Bowersock. You can see it if you go to one of the boat ramps in Lawrence, see it outflowing. They say you can drink that water before it goes into the, back into the river. I haven't tried it, but they say you can. This is some industry along the river. This is the Westar um, plant up in Lawrence that we more than likely get our electricity from, or at least some portion of it. This is a milky substance. So just to give you an idea, if we see something like that, that's something that we would go and investigate and figure out what it is and work on trying to get it taken care of. Kansas Department of Health and Environment is a really good partner with us on working on these cleanups. They're really good about um, working with us and, and sending people out and getting them cleaned up and remediating those. The hardest part is finding them because it's a 173 mile long river so we count on the public. So we count on the public to help us let us know when things are going on. So these are just some areas that need cleaned up. So um, just to give you an idea, we clean up the Kansas River. We do lots and lots of cleanups. This was the metal cleanup I was telling you about. So since you guys are history um, people, you'll love this. In the um, sandbar here, this one that we were working on, it's literally right below Bowersock. So if you drive over the Kansas River Bridge in Lawrence and look down on the east side and see that sandbar, that's where we pulled all of this out. But there was an old metal wheel wagon, big round wagon wheel and um, it had a um, axle, you could see it, and it went down into the sand. Our volunteers worked for hours to try and uncover that, and they never could, I mean, we hit, we hit dark darkness, and they never were able to get it. It'll eventually, I think the Kansas River will eventually cough it up, because um, that sand just keeps washing, but we found, um, we have found old stagecoaches in the banks of the Kansas River. One of our volunteers found one just last year, pieces of it. You know, not the whole thing intact, but pieces. We find uh, bison bones and we find arrowheads. That is not uncommon at all. We find them all the time. So the river, when it runs its circles, you know, where it goes, meanders through, when it goes on that outer edge, it takes sediment and then it deposits it at the next corner on the inner side. So where it's taking it is where you want to go. And so um, I have a lot of volunteers that just love to see what they can find. And so we go really slow on those outer banks and they'll try and find treasure. And you'll find all kinds of stuff. Now sometimes you find stuff you don't really want to find like a toilet or a bucket or something that is more modern day that you're like, well, that's not a find, that's trash. But um, sometimes we find some really cool historical stuff. And so we have actually, um, our, our uh, membership ha has um, donated or loaned, I should say, a bunch of artifacts 
to the Great Overland Station. So the Great Overland Station is going to do a Kansas River exhibit sometime this summer. And so we've, um, a lot of our members who have a lot of these pieces have loaned those. So make sure you go and see the exhibit at the Great Overland Station. Um, I'll share it with Ben so that he can put it out on his information. But they're going to have some really cool pieces on the river and some great artifacts. And have all of you been to um, the River Kings Museum in Lawrence? Yeah? Very nice with Barbara Higgins Dover. So make sure you go check that out. She's got a lot going on there about the history of fishing and her documentary, When Kings Reigned. You're going to show that next, next time? Yeah, um, so that's getting ready to come out. Uh, we're going to go and attend that showing as well. I'm sorry, that's in Topeka. Okay. Yep, it's um, on the north side of the river off, what, Kansas Avenue, like a couple blocks over. Um, so it's, if you go I-70 and then go across the big bridge, yeah. you'll see it. It's the old I train station. I no, 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 um, the bridge before that that's right downtown. What do they call that bridge? Yeah. I'm not very good with the Topeka uh, roads. I know where Kansas Ave is and I-70. It's a very nice building. They restored it and they have exhibits yeah. and stuff. It's, it's, worth, it's beautiful. It's worth the and they have a lot of railroad history there too. Um, and right, just literally just like two blocks over from it is an area that they've redone called the North. They call it Noto, North Topeka. But there are lots of antique stores and little shops and restaurants, some really good restaurants um, that are just right around the corner from the Great Overland Station, so you could make a day of it. Just got to notice I got a strong cell coming. It's involving coming this way. Okay. And, uh, Is it twirling? It's supposed to be here by 8 o'clock. Yeah. Oh. Oh, you got yeah. Okay, we got eight. <laughs> yeah. If you want to leave, one thing I'll just remind you, if you didn't know, the Kansas River is a public waterway. So from watermark to watermark, it is a public river. And so um, you can paddle, you can boat, you can camp, you can fish, you don't need a reservation. It's one of the last wild places in the state of Kansas that you don't have to have a permit or permission to, to go and use it. So this is a sunset. And it was designated as a river water trail in 2012. Okay. I assume so, yes. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I'm not familiar with the On that map right there, if you take one of those maps, my phone sure number is on there. Yeah. Does anyone, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask questions because you may want to head home. Do you so. see any evidence of climate change? Hmm? Do you see any evidence of climate change? You know, um, yes, we do. Because we see what's happening is, is that we have more and more of those five inch rains. We have very few of those really light rains, those really high rains that are happening as part of climate change. So, what we're experiencing is that 80% of the sediment removal. Um, sediment movement that's happening in the watershed and the sediment carries the nutrients 80% of that happens in the five biggest rain events in a year so our sediment is moving when we have those five inch rainfalls that's when the river is getting polluted it's not the small rainfalls and KDHE did a study on that but there is um, a professor at KU that's working on climate change study in rivers and he's actually comparing Mongolia to some rivers in the United States. And so it'll be really interesting to see what the outcomes are from his study. So, Are there any fish or fishing for the Paw River? There are some, yeah. The paddlefish, I believe, is native. Um, I don't think the cat, the, the channel cat is, no. There are some. I'm not sure what all of them are. But there are some, not very many. Are there uh, particular spots along the river that are more cited for pollution than others? Like just consistently yes. over time? It, it's called the, you know, the effect of everything 
um, being oh, in the, the system. Yeah, course, so yeah. Kansas City is way more polluted than Manhattan. Right. So when you're up in Manhattan, you're probably about in the cleanest spot <laughs> in the watershed. Um, but, you know, it's still got waters coming in. The, the river starts in Junction City, and it's where the Smoky Hill and the Republican Rivers meet. That's where the Kansas River starts. It goes 173 miles to Kansas City, and there are 19 boat ramps. So I brought you boat ramp maps that are there if you want one. There are 19 different ways to get on the Kansas River, and here in Eudora is one of them. The bow ramp in Eudora, I don't know if you've noticed it, but it is highly used. There are always vehicles in that lot. People are out on that river. They're fishing. They're canoeing. They're doing whatever, you know, they like to do on the river, camping. Well, by the by, uh, instructions about the tornado are on the, right by the door there on the exit. You'll see it. I'll also announce you know. that we're just under a severe thunderstorm yeah. warning. There's no tornado warning, okay. so Excellent. not to have a panic. That's good. That's, we're, we're completely safe. Did safe. you have another question? The, the rivers are better than they were 40 years ago when every town had a dump. Your door had a dump right there yep. in the river, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was piled up until the river got up and then whoosh. My dad was maybe. telling me... Um, he was, you know, when I got the job as the river keeper, this is going to make, I, I don't want to get too, but my dad passed away um, a year and a half ago. But before he passed away, we were down the DeSoto Bottoms and we were at the boat ramp and I had asked him to come and drive my truck for me um, to help me shuttle. And when we got done, he says, I want you to drive real slow. And I said, okay, why? And he said, because I'm going to tell you some stories. And he drove me through the river bottoms and told me about where my grandpa's house was that they lost in the 51 flood. And it wasn't where I thought it was. Um, and that old farmhouse that's down there in the bottoms now, that's where I grew up. And we just went through the bottoms and he was telling me all of these stories about the river. But one of the things he told me was about the tires. He said there was a guy from Kansas City that had an a auto business or a tire business and he would come out and talk to the farmers and, and ask them if they wanted some tires to stabilize their banks so that the um, river wouldn't take it. Well, that doesn't work. The only thing that holds a bank is trees and long, deep roots. That's what holds the bank. You want some really good trees or some long grasses um, that'll hold that bank. But um, he, had, he was telling me the story, and he said, you know, that's where a lot of these tires came from. You know, people just didn't know better. They thought that it was going to save their farm by putting these tires in there. And now here it is, 2017, and we're cleaning them all up. Because a lot of these tire sites are really old. A lot of them are. And evidently, the tires must have served a purpose been here that long. Yeah, they're still there, but they still had erosion on their on their farm. What it didn't you, keep it from eroding. What do you do to stabilize the river? To stabilize the river bank? Yeah, between here and your doors, it's washed away, but what does your group do to help? We um, volunteer with um, a local group to do, um, we're going to do one hopefully in Lawrence. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is that that land up to the river's edge is private property. So we can't touch it. That's landowner's responsibility. That's their land. So we tell people when they're on the river, you know, you can hang out on the sandbars and you can um, camp and you can fish, but do not go up those banks because you're trespassing. You're going to go onto someone's property. So like in Lawrence, we've got a stretch where it's city property and we are working with a native plant group, we're gonna remove invasive species and replant natives along there, and we're gonna use our volunteer base to do that. So we can do it if it's public property. Yeah, but somewhere there's a loophole, because how is it washing down here to where the river makes the curve and walk in the Weaver Bottom? How does it what? It's washed out hundreds of acres and nobody does anything about it. Right, and that's where that dredge hole is down in Weaver's no. Bottom. Oh, it started a long time ago. Long time ago? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. also that area right through there, if you've been on it, yeah. at least from my perspective, down on the river, there's no trees up there. They washed away. Yeah. They're, <laughs> That's why there's no trees. There's the rain. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what happened prior to. Well, um, you probably have the history of that way better than I do. Well, I was that the farmer went to Corps of Engineers, and they told him not to touch it. Not to touch it. 
and they had these cross arms out there. Somebody put Oh, in. I've seen those. Okay, yeah. and got in behind them and just took the country. Well, and down at DeSoto, you can see those cross arms all along the bank, and those were actually put in, I was told, by the railroad yeah. to keep the river from coming back and hitting yeah. the tracks. But now they're just pieces of metal that are hanging. Yeah, down here, out in the middle it of the river. It didn't keep it. Yeah. There's still lots of those all along there from DeSoto towards Cedar Creek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't, didn't work very well. We're learning more, but the trees really do hold the bank. Well, sure, they would. But this group is going to put this water well in out here on 15th Street. They were talking about pushing the city dump out. I know. I mean, you know, but that is going to get approved. Mm hmm I know, and Friends of the Call fought that, I believe, because that was before my time. Yeah, yeah I remember that because I was a volunteer back then. Jamie? Yeah, do you know anything about the, how the hydroelectric dam affects the river, and do you work with Bowersock? Or yeah, we work with Bowersock a lot. Uh -huh. um, they're... They have some of the oldest water rights on the river, and I've been told that they don't even come close to using them all, mm -hmm. that they're very conservative. Um, they do generate electricity that's clean electricity. Really, all they're, they're doing is they're um, pushing the water through their turbines to generate electricity. So um, we've worked with them on, like for example, they don't have fish passage on the dam. And people ask, well, why don't you have fish passage? Well, because Wildlife and Parks really doesn't want them to have fish passage because right now, as far as we know, the Asian carp are below Bowersock. They have not moved above. Now, Sarah, who owns and operates Bowersock, she and I think that's crazy. We think they probably have moved above Bowersock because when you're down there and the river's high, you can see them jumping like this. And it's like, they have to be, but no one has spotted them. No one has spotted them above Bowersock. You know what will happen. So <laughs> if you've never been hit in the head with an Asian carp, it's a, it's a whole new experience. And they don't just get hit with one. You get hit with about 50. And they go boom, 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 boom. And you're just ducking, you know. And um, so they're really uh, active. So I would think that we would, and they, and they multiply very quickly. So we haven't seen any yet up above Bowersock. And then Bowersock's getting ready to put in a portage around so that if you're in a canoe or a kayak, you can port around Bowersock without stopping at those two boat ramps. And that'll, I think she almost has all of her approvals for it. And she had to go through so many hoops um, because FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, they had to approve her plans for that. So it was kind of a long process, but a safety, I mean, it's a safety issue, so sure. we're glad that they went through all that. So they don't have a passage for fish to, to move from the western side of that lake, or river over across the bridge? Really? No, there's no fish oh. passage right now. Huh. But the current law or regulation says that, like, if anyone puts in a new dam on the Kansas River, they have to put in fish passage. Mm -hmm. So any new structures. I have kind of a dumb question, but is there any like uh, you know extreme recreation like whitewater rafting possible like in certain parts of the river or after a rainstorm or is it all just kind of you know kayaking and stuff like that? It's all pretty mellow. There's no whitewater, but the city of Topeka has a water intake that's extremely, extremely, extremely dangerous. Yeah. People have died, um, and there's big signs up that say you know don't go over this water intake. Um, so they're, they have approved through their council um, to spend the money to put in a chute and they're going to make it into like this whitewater chute um, that's going to be safe passage. So that'll be your whitewater. That'll be the only whitewater. Well, I'm not doing those. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard that even the chute out of um, Clinton can be 10 minutes worth of white water. Oh, yeah, right where that little, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's right there by the dog park where it dumps down. And, yeah, people do go and, and, and white water, I guess, that section when they're letting water out. 
that's still, because you know we have this, this law in our state that the only public waterways are the Kansas River, the Missouri River, and the Arkansas River. All other waterways are private. So you have to have landowner permission on both sides of the lake, in order, or the river, in order to paddle on that or fish or whatever you're going to do. So where the, it's federal land, you can use it. So below Clinton is federal property, so they can paddle there um, on that chute area. Now we go on the upside of Clinton all the time. If the Kansas River is too high, we take groups up on the Wakarusa. There's a boat ramp. And it's four miles above Clinton, and we go up there, we put our kayaks in, paddle down to the reservoir, turn around and paddle back. Because that river's impounded, it has no flow. So you can go against the current, if you want to call it a current. It's more like paddling up a lake. So there's not a whole lot. So, yeah, so people do that. As long as, you know, I, I just always tell people, you know, you need to know what the law says. Um, you know, people say, well, I paddle up, you know, down the Delaware out of Perry Lake. I'm like, well, that's trespassing. Did you get landowner permission? Because that's what the law says. So they have to, like, if you go to the Eudora boat ramp, if you take a right, it's public. Because you go all the way down to the Kansas River. If you take a left, you're trespassing. So we are, we are membership based, just like the historical society. We have members, and so part of our funding comes from memberships. Part of our funding comes from fundraisers. We just did the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Lawrence, and we're getting ready to do Beers of the Caw in November. And then we have an astronomy and wine event that we do over the summer. And then um, we do grants. So like the river inventory that I'm going to do this summer, it's grant funded. I got a grant from REI to do that. Uh, Patagonia has given us grants to fight dredging, um, so we just have grants that we apply for to supplement our funding. Is it an always Yes, we're a nonprofit. It's always an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any Very other impressive. questions? Yeah. You may not want to go to your yeah, car now. I, 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 I do. But, uh, I, this is probably a you know I, I'm, I know it's not talked about officially, but. Uh, the Oglala Aquifer in the western Kansas, as you know, in a lot of places is running dry, really dry. Um, have there been any talks between, you know, experts, people like yourself, your counterparts in the yes. West? Yes, everybody's talk, talking about Talk it. about using, you know, diverting, you know, <laughs> getting another water source or use, using the car. Or, so there have been a lot of different things floating around. <laughs> so first of all, we know that the water is depleting in the aquifer. Um, the Kansas Water Office is working with landowners out there to try and come up with different strategies. One of them is um, a LEMA, which is like this, um, where everybody voluntarily, everybody in a certain area voluntarily reduces their water consumption. And so they want to still make it voluntary. They don't want to put in regulations. So right now they're working on these voluntary programs. Um, one of the issues that we have, and of course it's not my river, but the Arkansas River at Garden City doesn't flow at all, and it's because it's over-allocated. It's not because of Colorado. Colorado delivers every, every drop of water they're supposed to deliver into the Arkansas River, but we over-pump it. So it's over-allocated. It's got too many water rights on it. And so, but the problem is some of those water rights are really, really old. I mean, they really, really go far back. So how do you fix something like that? That's really hard when you've got so many people that have had it for so long. You, you mentioned um, Colorado delivers every uh, drop of water that they're, they're supposed to. Um, Legally that, supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> is that based on the percentage of how much water flows? Or how, how, does, it mean, how does anyone know that they're... I don't know that? what the exact calculation is, but recently the state of Kansas and the state of Colorado just got done going through a big fight over that. Um, and they now do deliver all the water. At one time they did not, and so people thought that it was just because of, the, of Colorado that, that the Arkansas River was dry. But now that they're delivering it all, it's still dry. The water table's dropped. There's no water. Thank you, guys. So, um, yeah, it's an ongoing battle. I'm not, like, totally up to speed on all of the issues out that way, but I hear them in my regional advisory meetings that um, 
that we go to and the water office meetings. They had a water um, authority meeting today in Garden City. So they meet all over the state. But so I didn't go because that was a really long drive. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? So the Midwest is really the most underrepresented for river keepers. Um, there are tons of them on the East Coast and the West Coast, um, on, on mostly on the coastal communities. But in the Midwest, um, we have one in a couple of them in Colorado. We have one on the Upper Missouri, one in the Quad Cities, and we just got one on the um, uh, White River in Arkansas. Um, so they're slowly, and we have one in Oklahoma. There's one in Oklahoma. We're working on getting one on the Arkansas, so we may get another one in Kansas. I'm really mm -hmm. excited. There's a... Nobody on the plat. No, nobody on the plat. We need somebody on the plat. We really do, that we could kind of work with on some of these issues. But the one in, um, that may come on the Arkansas, I think there are ways out, but they're thinking about... there's. You have to have a nonprofit group that can support locally that river keeper. So you have to have a nonprofit organization that's willing to do the fundraising. And Friends of the Caw was perfect for that. So, but I just want to show you this is the river with all the maps. I'll just flip through these so you can see. These are all the boat ramps. So Junction City, Ogden, and Manhattan, St. George, Wamigo, and Bellevue. Topeka has three boat ramps, one at the governor's mansion called Call State Park, um, one at the water intake, which is this one here where it's so dangerous, and this one's at Seward Avenue. Perry LeCompton and Lawrence. Lawrence has three of them. This one down here on the bottom right, that's when Mud Creek used to have water. Um, and then... This is my stomping grounds, Eudora, DeSoto, and Cedar Creek. So this is Eudora right here, putting in right below that bridge. And this is the big DeSoto ramp and the Cedar Creek ramp. Edwardsville, Turner Bridge, and then Caw Point. So I always like to tell people about this one. If you've never been to Caw Point, you should go. So it's down in Kansas City by the Fairfax District. Um, most people don't even know it's there, but it's a neat little park, and you can walk um, a paved trail all the way down to this point. When you get to that point, uh, you can see where the Kansas River meets the Missouri, and they're doing their little fight. That is my son. He's probably saying, do you know there's a storm coming? Um, so Call Point is one of the uh, neatest places. So if you ever have the opportunity, you should go visit that. It's really pretty. You can see the entire downtown Missouri skyline. So these are just some navigational hazards. These are through Topeka. This is that old railroad bridge that's down, that fell in the 1951 flood. And you know there's locomotives down there. Wouldn't that be cool if we ever got them out? You know, so the Topeka Riverfront Authority is an org is a group that was put together by the governor and charged with developing the riverfront in Topeka. And so we've been working with them for the last couple of years. And they're going to do some pretty cool stuff in Topeka. But they asked us, they're like, can you guys get that out of there? I'm like, I don't think we have the resources for that. <laughs> I don't know. You'd have to get one of those big barge things or something. Much bigger than what we can... I asked, I actually asked Westar's green team. I said, you guys think you could get that out? And he's like, no. <laughs> he said, ask the governor. Yeah, ask the governor and pull it out. <laughs> this is Barasak. Um, this is the portage around Water One in Johnson County. You can port around it. There's a water intake. So um, Water One gets a huge amount of their water off the Kansas River for Johnson County water supply. And funny enough, if you didn't know this, they also get water from the Missouri River for Water One. These are just some of our volunteers. This is what drives Friends of the Call right here. It's our volunteer base. We have a huge volunteer base, and they do a lot. Cleanups, everything you can think of. If you guys ever want to be a paddle assistant, Andy here has joined us as a paddle assistant. So we... Uh, 
help with our paddle trips when we go out on the river. This is the Great Call Adventure Race between Eudora and DeSoto. We had a great time doing that. Um, that was a lot of fun. So much fun. People uh, ran, paddled the Kansas River, and biked back. So paddled to DeSoto and then biked all the way back. It'll be again this year. It's going to be September 30th, I think. It's a Saturday. And we um, will be there. We'll help provide all the boats for people to use. And then we're a membership. If you're interested in becoming a member, it just helps us increase our voice. So these are our events. Wine Song at Riverfest is June 3rd. It's a DeSoto Rotary event, but it's a wine tasting of Kansas wineries. And all the proceeds go back to nonprofits. So Friends of the Call has been a beneficiary of that, so we like to help them promote that. Great Call Adventure Race, Astronomy and Wine, and our newest thing is Beers of the Call. You may not be a beer drinker, but it is a pretty cool concept. We have a watershed map, and we map all the breweries in the watershed. And then we have a beer tasting. So we use beer to teach people about the watershed. Yeah, we do. <laughs> this is our website, kansasriver.org, if you'd like to find out more. Any more questions? Equip deluging. Can you give us a sneak peek how many breweries there are in this watershed? Well, last year we had, so what we do is we keep adding new breweries to the taste testing. Last year I think we had 12 or 13 breweries that we taste tested. We've already got two more from Nebraska. We're working on one in Colorado. But we're working on mapping all of them. It's they keep popping up. Yeah. I mean, three more showed up in Topeka. Wow. And it's like all these little breweries it was everywhere. Crying tiger for the longest one. Blind tiger. Blind here in trying to start. Yeah. Well, I hope they do because we're going to be asking them to come to Beers of the Call. That would be awesome. So, anything else I can answer for you? It's a lot of information, but I hope you got something out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for coming and being in the Drive to stay dry.